All right, hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, welcome back from the briefings. Uh, so today is the third part of our developability talks and updates. All right, thanks so much. And uh, I apologize that this time I will be picking because I will write some uh, funny equations in the blackboard or in the uh, iPad. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so. Uh, this is the third part. I should of course credit uh, uh, Uri because he started this seminar and it was really, really motivating for me to see how he presented the topic. Uh, so I will just quote. I think it's when I record it. Um, but uh, let me just sort of review sort of the big picture or at least kind of what we uh, had in mind uh, when we uh, when we program the the the, uh, the mini series. Um, so there are three parts, and the first part had to had something to do with duality, and um, Uri explained beautifully how the sort of electromagnetic duality ports to gravity, and in particular, uh, uh, it's also there in gauge theory, right? So the hydrogen atom, uh, it's sort of the electric part of the uh, of, of this duality, and the monopole is magnetic part, and then we have sort of the dion that connects both uh, in gauge theory. Uh, and then what happens in gravity is, of course, there is a beautiful uh, realization of the duality itself. Um, but we focus uh, in part two in this in this uh, in this character here, the sub uh, which means that it's invariant under duality. And we said that it's not so far from care. And in this talk, I, I will explain what being sort of near sort of near care means. So let's say that it's kind of closely related to care. Uh, but they share many properties. In particular, they, sh they share symmetries, right? So they share conformal symmetries. Uh, as I explained, there's some sort of near horizon symmetry, and they see symmetries uh, near uh, near the black hole. Uh, and then uh, that was that was part two. And in part three, we will sort of delve more into uh, what these symmetries are and what's their action on phase space. And I, I sort of motivated this last last time by by by, by explaining that the sort of key ingredient we, we need to solve for uh, sort of uh, understanding phenomenology, say the, the photon ring or quasi normal modes, the ring down, all of that is encoded in these two equations, the wave and the geodesic equation, and they are they are related by uh, what's called the aconal approximation. And uh, and then sort of I hinted that you know all this thing was worked out at some point with uh, with twist of theory. And of course, that's not true, but we would kind of summarize what's uh, known from the twister perspective. So uh, just to give you a, a very 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 short flavor of uh, of what happened last talk, uh, we were analyzing this metric. Uh, this is called the care metric with a nut charge, also referred to as care tau nut. Uh, 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 and it has some other, some other names, um, but uh, it's essentially the care metric, all right? So this may may look familiar, this uh, sort of functions here. Um, delta is the usual uh, sort, of, um, um, uh, sort of redshift factor, and we have rho, which is some kind of radial coordinate. And the, the new thing is this n component here, uh, which we think of some kind of magnetic analog of uh, the uh, uh, so for gravitational analog of the magnetic charge, uh, we refer to it as nut charge. Um, and um, uh, we will focus on the case where M is equal to N. So what that means is that we are dealing with the self-dual case. Um, now that means in the in the in the in the in terms of the Riemann tensor that so, and, Alfredo, yeah, please. N can have either sign, is that right? Yeah, good, 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 good. Yeah, so n is parity odd and m is parity even, which means that the relation has to have a uh, plus minus here. Plus minus is there. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Right. So that metric is the vacuum solution. Is that right? Right. For this problem. Mm -hmm. So one thing I was confused about is what does the geodesic equation look like? Does it depend on the nut charge of the test particle? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it, it does depend on the nut charge, yeah. Okay, so when you write the geodesic equation, it's not just the curvature of space-time. It's got more to it then. Uh, well, it's a curvature of space-time, but it has contributions from the nut charge. 
know, but he's asking about the nut charge of the particle itself. Particles. Oh, yeah. Yes, particles. Particles. Oh, no, no, no. The topic of that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. We should we should be more more precise. So we're talking about a, a black hole that has uh that has mass. Yeah, and the nut charge. Uh, angular momentum. Yeah. And nut charge. Right. Right. And we think of this as essentially the electric charge, and this is the magnetic charge in the gravitational theory. Good. Um, so this, of course, will couple. If we couple a particle, that yeah. particle can have, uh, say, a spin, uh, a mass, and also can have some some form of uh, of uh, of a nut charge. So in fact, this this will indeed couple in the same way that magnetic moments couple. Okay. So, yeah. So the geodesic will be different. Yeah, depending for, on the nut charge. Yeah, for particles that are charged under uh, under the nut parameter. Uh, yeah, well, I think I think, uh, um, I think that it's not. Well, it depends what we mean by the nut charge of a particle. I think we don't understand our local excitation of a nut charge. Uh, I mean, uh, they can have a component that couples to the anti-self-dual part. And they, they can couple yes. a, a, a point particle can couple to the uh to the uh self dual part and the anti self dual part, right? Yeah, we can have two different kind of couplings. So uh, one more question on this. Like so if you have just mass and spin, like there's no n equal to zero, let's say. If you have a spinning uh particle, like a pole dipole particle, it has mass and a spin, then it will move along geodesics. If it, uh, but its spin vector will be will not be parallel transport. It will be Fermi Walker transported. Right. But it's that's because it's coupling to the background frame dragging spin, etc. Right. So in the nut case, also I would imagine that the particle is just moving along geodesics, but its other degrees of freedom will probably not be parallel transported. Yeah, its right. spin will not be properly. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. So, so its yeah. velocity vector, I think, will probably still be parallel transported. The, the, the four velocity will probably just be geodesically transported. It is my guess. Yeah, maybe we can discuss that. later, but yeah. my yeah. question is that it's all fully understood. That is also a good great point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. This has to do with what's the point particle action for this problem. So of yeah. course it's not just the tau, right? Right. One writes the one's right, one writes the, the tau component, which is sort of the particle term, but there's also something like S mu nu, uh, depending on you know all the spin degrees of freedom here. And there's also some cut, some couple, some coupling to the Riemann tensor or and the anti sub dual part of the Riemann tensor. So there are many couplings we can write. So you, oh, I see, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so these are these are kind of uh, internal degrees of freedom. Um, but uh, yeah, this is interesting because in, in fact, one one motivation for this was to discuss uh, monopole scattering or, or dipole scattering when we have you know some sort of uh, two body problem. Uh, but I, I will go into that you know, a little later. Um, so uh, what we what we observed was that uh, in this configuration, m equals to minus plus or minus m, there is some funny simplification. And uh, in fact, uh, by by uh, introducing some coordinates, so let me just call coordinates set one and set two, uh, we can absorb the dependence on the spin. Right? I'm just reviewing what what happened uh, in the last talk. We can absorb the dependence on the spin, essentially introducing some coordinate like this. And then uh, we, we, we observe that essentially the spin can be removed by, by the fermorphism. Um, yeah. And set so two is essentially the same. So, um, so we find this sort of simple metric. And in this metric, there is a particular conformal structure. Uh, there is a particular conformal structure that's a sub r because sub r in fact, uh, one of them is explicit and the other one is um, not very explicit. Let me just say that. Um, okay. Uh, what was the uh, sort of uh, 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 end point and uh, sort of uh, end result of, of this conformal structure? Well, essentially that we have uh, killing Janotens just coming from the, the, the conformal structure of the, of the metric. And in fact, we have four. Uh, we have four killing Yano tensors. They satisfy the killing Yano equation. Um, um, they are anti-symmetric tensors. Um, three of them we label with, with one, two, three. That means they will rotate under SO3, under this SO3, that's rotation. And one of them we don't label, it's a single. Okay, so this one indeed uh, doesn't really uh, uh, doesn't really rotate. And then uh, using this killing Yano tensor, we can square them. 
and uh, we square them uh, essentially uh, uh, by symmetrizing their uh, sort of matrix product. And uh, the, pro the product of this killing killing tensor satisfies the killing equation. Okay, and then uh, we take uh, these three combinations. These are the uh, these are the uh, three uh, uh, sort of triplets. And I want I wanted to emphasize uh, a little bit of because so someone asked me, okay, how many combinations we can have? Uh, we can take you know four four choose two different combinations. In fact, we can repeat. Uh, uh, different combinations, and when we can have many, many killing tensors, right? But in fact, uh, we only care about this, this, this three. And uh, and the reason is that essentially we think of this uh, as uh, Pauli matrices. So in indeed, uh, for instance, if you take um, say any Pauli matrix square, right? Uh, any Pauli matrix square, you get one. So in 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 terms of the uh, in terms of the killing Jano tensors, so let me just call this Y. Uh, let me let me use screen here. So let me just call this y, uh, y1, y2, y3, right? So what happens if you square, say, y? You square it like this, right? And then uh, you square it like this. And then you get this one. Uh, but it, it, y in terms of a tensor, right, is, uh, is indeed the metric. Uh, this is kind of the covariant version of, of the identity. Uh, so that means that in, indeed the, the metric is a killing tensor. So indeed, the metric uh, satisfies, you know, the killing the killing tensor equation. But it's not a killing tensor we care about uh, because, uh, of course, it's the, it's the background. Uh, then we can take any any sort of uh, killing tensor. We square it. We also get the metric. So these combinations are 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 yeah, sort of independent. Uh, the ones that we we uh, we. Uh, the ones we, we choose to find the killing yeah, the killing tensors are these ones. So this one we call K1. And this is like multiplying sigma one with sigma zero, which is in, in some way is kind of a boost, is sigma zero one. Uh, so that's just to give some intuition on how, uh, how how we think of these killing tensors in this transforming in this in this triplet. Um and, and does this go through for the y1, y2 part as well? Y one, Y two. Oh yeah. So what? What? Yeah. Good. So what is Y one, Y two, right? Uh, so Y one, Y two. Uh, that gives. Uh, if you actually do this product, it would be something like uh, like uh, Y. Uh, if you if you think about Pauli matrices, right? This is like sigma three. Yeah, exactly. So it's something essentially that looks like Y three Y. Right, so so that's just to say that all these combinations at the end of the day, uh, we just care about this tree and the metric, and uh, and we saw that once we have something that satisfies the killing tensor equation, we can define a conserved charge. We can define a particular operator of the wave of the wave equation uh, and a particular conserved quantity of the geodesic equation. Right, so uh, in fact. We have these three uh, components, and we argue that these three components are conserved. These are the Laplace from Gerens vector of the classical Kepler problem. And uh, and for care, uh, actually, we 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 sort of mentioned that for care, uh, indeed, you lose two of this of this uh, of these components, and you only keep the sort of asymmutal component of the NRL, and that's usually uh, referred to as a Carter Carter constant. Okay, but I didn't really explain how these two components are broken, how the symmetry is broken. So I, I hope I can get to that point today. Okay, um, uh, I should I should mention, because we're moving to the wave equation, uh, how the quantum numbers work. Again, this is also part of the review. Uh, the quantum numbers just operate uh, uh, by separating this uh, Laplace from Gilles vector. Uh, so remember, A here is uh, LRL and LI is uh, angular momentum. So uh, what we do is okay. The SO three algebra of the angular momentum is untouched. Then we have uh, the fact that LRL rotates under angular momentum generators, and then there is this property also of LRL vectors. So now we can just separate these two algebras by introducing this m plus and minus. They are sort of uh, independent uh, commuting, 
And that means that they define quantum numbers, right? So we have two set of commuting operators. They are symmetries of the Hamiltonian. So that means they uh, define uh, sort of uh, seven quantum numbers. Uh, but indeed, these quantum numbers are not independent because, uh, in fact, they uh, they multiply to a Casimir. Uh, so this is some kind of group theory uh, uh, argument. But one can show that, uh, in fact, the Casimirs of these SO two R's, these SO threes are are equal. So indeed, uh, there is no uh, as many quantum numbers. Is that sort of clear? Okay. So okay. So that brings us to uh, to today, and today we will uh, analyze the wave equation, and uh, we hopefully will connect it to twisters. Hopefully. Uh, so let's start with the uh, sort of usual form of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, we will consider, for instance, the Dion system. So in the Dion system, uh, essentially what happens is that uh, I have the usual sort of electromagnetic uh, Coulomb potential, uh, uh, and then I can relate uh, this sort of coupling constant to uh, if I have two point particles, right? If I have two point particles, both of them have electric and magnetic charge, then this is kind of the effective coupling between these two particles. And uh, the way that the dion, the dion sort of magnetic charge enters, essentially through a particular uh, redefinition of momentum. Uh, I actually put here. Uh, so uh, momentum here is not just say d d x mu, but it also has a, a particular uh, uh, magnetic charge, as you expect usually from uh, from coupling things to a gauge field, and this is essentially uh, the Dirac uh, is essentially a Dirac monopole. Now, if you shift uh, this momentum. Uh, 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 what you find is a momentum uh, generator don't commute. Uh, we will we will see that in a second. Uh, let me just say that there is a particular uh, um, uh, uh, non-relativistic version of this equation, of course, uh, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but there is also the relativistic sort of Klein Gordon equation, uh, given essentially by changing the kinetic term. But in both cases, in both cases uh, for the Dion. Uh, in the relativistic or, or non-relativistic setup, uh, you introduce this magnetic charge by shifting the uh, momentum. And, and this mu here is essentially related to this quantity that Uri explained on the first part of the, of the, of the miniseries, uh, which is this combination that happens to be duality invariant and is quantized. We can say it's an integral or times or proportional to an integral. Okay, so this is just explaining uh, what I was mentioning. <clears throat> the fact that translations, of course, uh, don't commute. Uh, they sort of commute to the um, to the uh, field strength. And the fact that this potential we have here is essentially this Dirac, Dirac monopole is singular in the uh, North Pole uh, of uh, in, in the spherical coordinates, right? So it's in particular gauge. So you can see that there is already a singularity uh, in the wave equation. In the actual uh, in the actual Schrodinger equation, we have functions which are singular, which are not defined along this uh, along this Dirac string. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I have a question on this. So you have two particles here, right? Yeah. And uh, the indices are space time indices. So where is this uh, Dirac string in space? So when you draw so, this diagram, it's good, a space-time diagram, right? Good, good, good. So we are we are going to the uh, we are going to the center of mass frame here. Right? Okay. So okay. we start with two two dions. Mm -hmm. uh, both have their own uh, sort of Hamiltonian, but we sort of introduce this relative uh, this relative distance here. And and so in the center of mass frame, essentially you see uh, the Dirac string at the origin. I see. Okay. And is this some assumption that they are both the same mass? No. Um, oh, you 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 are asking about what's m here? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think m is the it must be the reduced mass. Oh, okay, okay, right, right. Yeah. Uh, the 
There's another question. The you said that it'll commute along the direct string. So is that that F is like a direct delta on if you evaluate that commutator on the direct string and it's regular if you evaluate off the direct string? Is that what you mean? Oh no, sorry. I, I don't think it's a delta function. I think um F is regular. Yeah, F is regular, yeah. Sorry, I said uh, yeah. I don't uh, think I said it is regular everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, F is regular everywhere. Yeah. It's it, because this direct string, as you know, is, is a gauge choice, right? Yeah. So you can actually rotate it to wherever you want. So in it, uh, the the field string is regular. Okay. Now I'm gonna skip some technical steps that people like to uh, to to do in, in many papers. Actually, let me give you the reference. I think the first person to know this uh, to know this was Swansiger. Swansiger. Uh, 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 very early, and uh, essentially he noticed that you can rewrite if you add some integration factor, which I'm, I'm not describing here, this Schrodinger equation in this form. Uh, the, this pi here is the same pi I just described, and so you multiply by some function of r. Here is just r, the, the coordinate radius, and you sort of shift the Schrodinger eigenvalue, right? The eigenvalue of your Hamiltonian now, now appears in this in this uh, square root here. And uh, and remember that alpha is essentially the, the electric charge. So this sort of funny looking uh, equation is not really the Schrodinger equation, it's some massaging of, of the Schrodinger equation, but it has a very, very beautiful feature is that the Hamiltonian or the sort of wave operator here can be promoted to an SL2R algebra. Okay, so that what that means is that I can introduce two other operators, say gamma four, defined in this way, it's just a minus sign, and T, which essentially is just some kind of uh, dilatation. So now we're talking about something conformal, right? So let's call this sort of dilatation. Uh, uh, because as you as you see, it, it acts uh, by scaling r if you act with some canonical bracket here, uh, uh, and then uh, what happens is that I find just by commuting these operators, I find uh, an algebra, right? And uh, indeed, in this algebra, I can take my gamma zero to be uh, sort of my Hamiltonian, and gamma four and and t. Uh, to be essentially A and A dagger, A or A dagger. So what what that, what that buys me is a ladder algebra, so that my Hamiltonian is the uh, sort of uh, weight of my ladder, and I can raise and lower uh, levels by by using these operators. So I know exactly what the spectrum is, and in fact, you find the spectrum by by assuming that this algebra is compact. So gamma zero has integer values. And then what you find after solving for uh, gamma zero, or sorry, solving for energy here, equating this to N, uh, gives you back the sort of Balmer uh, spectrum for the for the uh, hydrogen atom. So this is the uh, non-relativistic limit. Good, yeah. So this is the, the uh, non-relativistic limit okay. that, um, I think I think indeed we can map the relativistic problem to the same equation. I I think so. Swansiger didn't do that, but later on it was realized that even the relativistic problem can, can be mapped to a, to a Yeah, this is the work of uh, I mentioned Barut and yeah. another guy that realized that the symmetry structure exists in all of these problems. Yeah, and Klein Gordon and Dirac. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's on this. This is Baruch for us. Yeah, I was just curious. Do you, do you know that this is a different symmetry from the from the hydrogen atom? Is it like do all of these problems tend to have the same spectrum despite the symmetry? That that's over is one over. It is it, the way it is, I guess. So yeah, so we want to understand where the symmetry is coming from. Uh, I'm just sort of explaining how to get the spectrum. Uh, but we want to understand. Uh, what's the sort of larger symmetry group where all of these things are, are coming from? So right now we have these hints of different different, uh, different uh, operations. Uh, but one thing to notice is that these are not really nice because these are quadratic uh, in momentum, right? So 
indeed, if you were to write them as differential operators, it would be quadratic in derivatives. So not something like a killing vector, actually more like a killing tensor. So it's some, some sort of higher form of symmetry. Uh, okay, I, I should mention this, uh, uh, just because it's uh, really likes this sort of functions called the monopole harmonics. And the way that they are introduced uh, essentially by sort of decomposing, uh, and, and this equation is actually not super precise here, uh, is by decomposing this P square into uh, a radial component and an angular component. So in usual, in usual uh, classical mechanics, we can use spherical coordinates to write momentum square, the, the uh, Laplacian operator. And uh, in this case, we can decompose it also in radial coordinates. But because pi is shifted by this mu, I remind I remind you that uh, there's a particular uh, shift here uh, in in uh, in my in my momentum. Then essentially, what 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 happens is that my angular momentum is also shifted by this mu, and and this is known in the classical problem. Uh, in the classical problem uh, with a magnetic monopole uh, or man, or uh, or a dion uh, uh, potential. Uh, we know that the angular momentum is not conserved. What's conserved is this sort of, uh, I should say the orbital angular, angular momentum is not conserved. What's conserved is this combination of orbital plus sort of intrinsic, uh, intrinsic uh, magnetic uh, moment. So this is kind of re realizing the notion that this magnetic moment is some sort of angular, angular momentum, uh, angular parameter. And the solution of this of this problem with J instead of L is uh, is called the monopolar harmonic. Okay, and these are essentially some generalization of the of the spherical harmonics uh, that will not play any role, but in the following, but it's 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 nice that we can solve them explicitly. And I should say, in order for the monopolar harmonics to be uh, single valued, indeed you need mu to be uh, an integer. So that's another way of seeing the, the quantization. Okay, so so now come we come to uh, Dominic's question. So what is the maximal symmetry? What's the biggest symmetry group we are talking about here? And uh, we know again from the work of uh, Pauli even uh, that the hydrogen atom has some conformal symmetry, or uh, uh, the sort of higher version of that conformal symmetry is O four comma two. So this includes LRL, includes uh, includes uh, angular momentum, includes this other funny ladder algebra, includes all of this. Uh, uh, and it's also symmetry as was observed by Barut and, and company that it's also symmetry of Dion system. And then in, in, in co complete contrast to that situation, we have the Kerr black hole, which has no conformal symmetry a priori. It has all the uh, time translation symmetry and, and angular symmetry. And with these two symmetries, you know, you cannot do much. You need something else. Of course, we know now that it's the Carter constant. Uh, so how is that related to this sort of conformal symmetry? Well, uh, uh, I hope I sort of uh, convince you that in the self dual case, in the self dual case, uh, uh, this sort of uh, uh, U1 cross U1 symmetry is promoted to 0, 0,2. Now, we will see exactly how that happens in a second. Um, but let me just remind you one more time, because it's gonna be very important, uh, how to go from uh, how to go from boyer Linquist in the usual, in the usual uh, uh, sort of uh, spheroidal coordinates, uh, where you only see explicitly uh, time translation and uh, sort of an angular symmetry to the uh, to the uh, conformal sort of conformal coordinates. And in these coordinates you will see uh, the whole the whole conformal conformal group. Um, but one thing that I didn't mention before is that again the spin can be completely removed in the subtle point. And uh, once you are in this point, uh, you can ask okay what's the sort of spin zero version of uh, of this sort of Kerr tau nut, right? So this is what we call uh, what we call uh, tau nut, right? So just tau nut without the spin. And the reason I'm mentioning this is solely because uh, it can be written in a sort of flat-like coordinate system. 
So instead of using this Boyer link piece or, uh, or uh, uh, whatever coordinates we use usually for Churchill, which are spherical, we can use sort of rectangular coordinates and we can introduce uh, essentially a potential function. In this case, it's just uh, the Schwarzschild, uh, Schwarzschild potential. And uh, we introduce a gauge field. So the two elements of this sort of tau nut system are the potential of Schwarzschild and a particular gauge field, which is essentially the gauge field I, I showed for the Dion system. Uh, 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 so, so that's just to say that in this tau nut system, there is sort of electric component and magnetic component. So this potential here, A5, is essentially the potential that origins the, the Dirac string. Um, so in the gravitational case, we call it Misner string. Um, um, uh, so we can we can write down the wave equation for this system, and it's essentially uh, the same wave equation as the Dion system. Uh, so that is uh, completely non-trivial, but it's kind of in in it's the intuition is that there's a particular sort of electric component of the field, and there's a particular magnetic component of the field. Now I will I will sort of derive this result uh, in this in these other coordinates now. Uh, Alfredo, in this, I, I forget the details, but uh, in Dobnut, along the Misner string, uh, what does the curvature do? Is it regular there? Or yeah, I think it's the same. Everything is the same. It's the same. As the, I see. Yeah. There's no conical defect. No, it's there. a conical. It's a conical yeah. defect. But, but the yeah. curvature is okay. is always regular. Right. Okay. Well, if you have a conical defect, you may say it's it's singular, right? Yeah, it's singular, but it's not curvature singular. Right, right. Yeah, it's a conical and singular. Yeah. I'm a bit confused by this line element. Is that like, uh, is that the exterior derivative of dt minus two m a phi? There's a d phi. I think that's missing. Yeah. Well, uh, you can include. Or, yeah, right. Like, oh, All right. Yeah. This is this a. Yeah. Thank you for this. Yeah. Let me ask. Yeah. It's a phi. Uh, in fact. Yeah. It's, it's oh, a phi d phi. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, so this is something we can do at the softball point. And uh, in fact, it was it was uh, it was done nicely also uh, uh, by uh, Gibbon and Sun Hawking. This is called the Gibbon's Hawking ansatz of self dot nut. And after you, after you impose Einstein equations in such an answer, in, 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 indeed you find that this function here uh, has to be has to be harmonic. And for a non circular point, uh, the V of R will depend also on the nut parameter. V of R. Yeah, and the metric would take different form. I see. Not, it, it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually didn't know. Well, V is defined, strictly speaking, the Gibbons and Hawking, I think, define V only for, for this uh, form, the metric. And away from the circular point, yeah. it's not uh, this form. Yeah, yeah. So the sort of moral of the story is that self-dual is kind of rectangular. It's kind of flat, uh, with a particular uh, potential here, which is essentially the Newton potential, and a particular gauge field, which is essentially the monopole gauge field. Okay. So that was all. The, all the stuff by Gibbons and Hawking. So what's the new stuff? Uh, the new stuff is that in these sort of coordinates. In these conformal coordinates, and I call them conformal because essentially each of these set coordinates uh, parameterizes a conformal a conformal plane or a, or, or a Riemann sphere. Uh, so set one and set one bar uh, are a Riemann sphere, and set two and set two, two bar are a, another Riemann sphere. Uh, in these conformal coordinates, it's very easy to see what the symmetry generators are. Um, uh, you can you can uh, you can see immediately that L zero right so the conformal transformation that scales uh, set one and set two is the sort of generator of time translations and the the, the, the reason is that uh, under time time translations of course if you translate by time these two these two uh, these two uh, uh, phases will will shift. And then set one and set two will just scale with some 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 factor, right? 
And also you can see that the symmetry that uh, chip phi, the other symmetry, is essentially the same, but with a minus sign. So uh, indeed, set one and set two have different spin under uh, d phi. I, I didn't write this, but if I if I were to write L, L zero bar, which is essentially d phi, uh, I see that set one and set two have different spin under L zero bar, but same spin under L zero. Essentially, because they scale the same, but opposite with angle. And um, and then. Uh, what 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 I can check is that the um, L0 generator, which is my uh, time translation generator, uh, happens to be quantized essentially because uh, here time is periodic. So you can in indeed only define these coordinates where time is identified, right? Otherwise, it's not uh, it's not um, single value. So so here you can only introduce these coordinates if time is identified as uh, time plus uh, two pi uh, uh, four n, and this four m is surface gravity in this real case, or good. So four n is the inverse temperature. Okay. Yeah. So four n is the uh, if if we were in the Euclidean case, right? This would be the sort of inverse temperature, and indeed uh, in this two matter signature, it's still that. Um, so. The fact that time is compact here immediately tells you that uh, L0, this generator of time translation, is quantized. And that quantization uh, is exactly the same as the uh, quantization of the magnetic magnetic charge. So, so that's also one manifestation of this lemma here that is not param parameter that goes with the time translations uh, is uh, the analog of the magnetic charge. OK. Um, what happens with the wave equation? So this is one symmetry generator. I can write all the symmetry generators, uh, but uh, the most important one happens to be related to the wave equation. So I write the wave equation. Alfredo, sorry, one question on that. Uh, there you have at the centripetal fixed point n equal to m, right? So if you, all this at the centripetal fixed point. Yeah. So if I replace m n with m in all these equations, can you still make the claim that nut is magnetic and so on? So if you replace, so if I remove n from all these equations and just replace it with capital M. Oh, very good. So how very do you? So you have to probably go away from the self dual fixed point to say that this is truly a magnetic, uh, uh, you know, like this yeah, connection yeah, to yeah, make. Very good. Yeah. So indeed, uh, indeed, this is true for any uh, mass and n for any mass and not charge. Uh, that so identification of time. Uh, which you obtain by removing uh, conical deficits in the uh, uh, Euclidean signature or in this signature uh, is proportional to uh, to that charge. Yeah. So yeah, that's a very good catch because in, in this case, obviously M is N. So we don't really distinguish. But for general M and N, uh, this first temper inverse temperature is always proportional to N. Yeah. And time is also compact, so in, in this quantization, it still falls. So yeah, I'm confused about this time compact business. So it's repeating, right? Time? Yeah. Doesn't that already say that this is all crazy? <laughs> yeah, it's very crazy. It is crazy, and therefore, I mean, is it therefore saying that you cannot have a nut charge? Because if you want to have a nut charge, you must make time periodic. The question is what happens if time is not periodic, right? So if time is not periodic, uh, what you have is a conical deficit. Yeah. And that conical deficit is called the Meissner stream. Okay. So in this case, we avoid this Meissner stream by going to the quantization of this coordinate. But the Meissner stream, people yeah. like to do cosmology with it. I mean, there's a whole literature on what to do with when you have these strings. So, OK, so no, but just a second. So. You can put a nut charge, keep a conical deficit, and you don't need to make time periodic. Right. So that's perfectly OK. But you somehow don't like that uh, string. And so you have made time periodic and got rid of the conical deficit. OK, right. Yeah. That's a choice. That's a choice. Yeah, exactly. OK, OK. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add a yeah. short comment. I don't know if it's the same here, but in the, the Hawking radiation story, the, the reason the time is periodic there is when you switch to the Euclidean signature, you want calculations in Euclidean signature to map on uniquely the calculation of Lorentzian signature. And for that to occur, the time necessarily has to be periodic in the Euclidean signature. 
Um, I, I'm assuming there's a similar, I don't know if there's a similar thing going on here where in this coordinate system, you have both of these Z coordinates covering the Riemann sphere. Yeah. And therefore for calculations to uniquely map from the Riemann sphere to the original coordinate system you're in, you require the time to be periodic on the Riemann sphere. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly the same. And, and it, it comes essentially from this exponential factor, right? So if you were to write the sort of Lorentzian version of this, there would be a, a plus or minus t here, not an i tau. But when you do a weak rotation, you get this i tau here. And that means immediately that time is a phase. So, so that's kind of what they did also that give us how they did. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so so it's a way of avoiding the conical singularity. Uh, the conical singularity might be interesting by itself. Okay, so uh, what happens with the wave equation? So this is an important point because it don't matter. It doesn't matter if you are uh, in some uh, Lorentzian signature or in a, in a, in a, a Euclidean signature or in this two comma two signature. Essentially, uh, algebraically, the wave equation is still uh, the same wave equation. Of course, boundary conditions can change, but the symmetries of the equation are the same. Uh, so, so we want to understand if we want to understand all the symmetries. It's enough to consider uh, this signature. If we want to solve the equation using the symmetries, then we need to be more careful on the signature. Uh, and we need to be more careful about similarities and where our functions define and all of that. Uh, but yes, for the purpose of analyzing the symmetry structure, uh, uh, you can just completely, uh, uh, completely blindly solve uh, 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 the wave equation in, uh, in, uh, in Mathematica. And essentially, you just take this metric and compute the Christoffel symbols. These are very simple. And plug them into your uh, D'Alembertian. And you find that it's a complicated wave equation because you know, you're dealing with some curvature uh, space time, and you have all kinds of terms. But on the surface where L0 is a number, the wave equation simplifies to a very, very familiar problem, which is a quadratic kinetic term and a quadratic potential and some constant. Term. So, so we, we refer to this, we refer to this as the sort of four-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Which is an oscillator in the plane set one, set one bar, set two, set two bar. So it's an oscillator in, in, in the complex plane and it has uh, some funny signature, uh, but Algebraically speaking, it has a quadratic linear, sorry, it has a quadratic and a, a quadratic kinetic term and a quadratic potential. That's exactly what we expect uh, to solve using harmonic oscillator. And indeed, we can define a, a dagger as usually for harmonic oscillator and solve it uh, immediately. But that's not what we're after. We're after the symmetries. And to analyze the symmetries, it's better to uh, rescale these coordinates. Uh, by the frequency. So we can only do this uh, in the phase space because we are introducing the frequency here. So phase space transformation. So in the phase space of my of my equation, of my uh, solution, I'm going to rescale my sort of position coordinates by omega, by the frequency. And what I find is that uh, if you do the algebra, right, so, so I'm going to have uh, an extra omega uh, in the denominator here and an extra omega in the numerator, right? So, so the omegas here will cancel and I will get only one omega uh, from, from this term. So I, I, I just divide everything by omega. And what I get is essentially uh, p squared plus x squared equals mu. And I remind you that mu is 2 and omega, which is exactly what we have also for L0. So L0 uh, has been quantized as mu. And now we're finding that the wave equation is indeed the same sort of a structure. But in, in, instead of uh, L0, we have p squared plus x squared. Is this sort of clear? Right, because this is kind of the key point that, I, that I'm going to use in the following. So, uh, so we have two equations, right? We have the L0 equation, which is usually the one that defines the energy. And we have the uh, wave equation, which is uh, uh, just 
you know, an, an eigenvalue of the of the talent vertical. Okay, so so now this is how twisters come in. So we have these two equations. The first one is the energy, and the second one is the Klein uh, Gordon equation. But uh, if you want to have symmetries, right, the problem is that this Hamiltonian equation is complicated, it's quadratic, right? I mean, it's energy, so of course it's going to be some p square term. Uh, however, it's easier to analyze symmetries from uh, from linear perspective, from linear generators. And what we can do is to introduce a sort of Fourier transform that takes set bar to a variable that is is essentially the derivative of set, set bar. It's the momentum of set bar. So this some sort of phase space here. So here we keep set, but we replace set bar by dd set bar. Okay, this is just a mathematical mathematical trick. And what that trick buys you is a four-component vector, uh, uh, a four-component vector such that your uh, L0 equation and your H equation are now linear. So how does that happen? Well, L0 is easy to see because L0 uh, is essentially uh, just computing the weight of uh, of of these variables under the scaling, right? And all all of these variables just scale with a plus one, so it's just multiplying set with this set. It's just a dilatation. It's, it's essentially just uh, a scale of uh, set. Uh, but with H, it's more interesting because what happens is that um, you are mixing sort of quadratic terms. Okay, you're mixing uh, uh, the quadratic terms. So if you if you do the matrix multiplication here, I, if, you, if you do matrix multiplication, you essentially have something like this set, this set, uh, one identity. So this is a gamma matrix uh, of uh, of uh, four dimensions, and if I do it right, so you have this set here. Um, right. Uh, essentially, if you multiply all the cross terms, you will get you will get the uh, the quadratic term and the potential term. Is this sort of making sense? Uh, yeah. uh, just as a curiosity, like uh, I, I guess I'm not familiar. In, uh, I don't remember that. So I know that in quantum field theory, like normally you have to do like a Fourier transform in order like to look at the spectrum. Yeah. But, uh, but it's you know you normally Fourier transform both variables. Uh, but uh, I guess here you're doing like a partial Fourier transform. So you're doing Fourier transforming half coordinates. Yeah, it's a, it's, that's what's called a twist of transform. So we only put a transform half of the coordinates. It's, so, also like, it's also like Z1 is a function of R and theta, Z2 is a function of R and theta. So Z1, Z2 are like R and theta, and Z1, like D, D, Z1 part is like P, theta, P, R, and P, theta. So I think it works out in, as a phase space. Yeah, but you're running half the phase space. I guess it's the full thing because you have R, theta, P, R, P, theta. No, it, it, this is like, I think. I, I, I think they're two, they're two real coordinates, but I, I think they're uh, in the. I, 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 these, these are like uh, the the spinoral space kind of thing, right? So they're two. In the spinoral space, the number of coordinates are actually doubled for some reason, and you have to impose a reality condition to get to the to the uh, to the normal space time coordinates, if I remember correctly. Um, so so it's not yeah. so, so they're four coordinates and yeah. you're and you're you really just for each other half of them. So there are four uh there are four real coordinates. Yeah, they're four start real with, coordinates. Okay, so, so I, I cheated a little bit because of, co of course we, we start with four real coordinates, that means that set and set bar are complex conjugates, right? So they are not really independent. Uh uh and I kind of Skip that sort of conceptual conceptual uh, uh, point, but you have to complexify. Like you actually have to define the twister space. You have to complexify space time. 
And I have been avoiding this complexification scene because there are many questions and I actually don't really understand uh, what's the meaning of complex space times. But someone that understands this is Penrose and, <laughs> and, and, and he wrote a book about this. So indeed, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, you can say, okay, these subplot metrics are complex space times in the in, in Lorentzian signature. So all of this you can think of Lorentzian signature, but completely complexified. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so in in the in the in the two comma two signature, what we can do is uh, we can think of set one and set one bar as real but independent. Uh, so that's the sort of connection to uh, to complex space time. So a complexified space time uh, has all these coordinates uh, uh, complex and independent. In the case which are real and independent, you reach uh, two comma two signature, and that's called the sort of Kleinian signature. Uh, yes, because uh, you know Klein Klein kind of made this uh, connection. But uh, but then so we take these real coordinates set one and set set one bar and two bar, and we Fourier transform them in sort of real Fourier transform uh, to reach this uh, sort of twister space. Yeah, so technically it's twister space. Uh, people refer to it as RP3. Uh, yeah. Yes, because it's projective. Uh, but um, yeah. Uh, one small question. Like, what is the Z lower B? How do you define that? Like, how do you lower the index in this? Very, very good question. Um, yeah. So these are uh, these are four dimensional spinners. So indeed. Um, indeed, uh, you have to use a conjugate. I think that's that's the missing ingredient here because to lower the to lower the index, you need to sort of conjugate the spin. Is it with like the Chivita? No, you have to use a C. These are four dimensional. This this A and B uh, go from one to four. I see. So I think to conjugate uh, B, you have to use something like C, uh, the conjugation conjugation matrix from C. Okay, so that's what that's what yeah. I then it'll give you the correct hammer to anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good, it's a very good point. Um, so essentially, the 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 the, the more of the story is that uh, uh, when you take this variable, uh, you can sort of uh, consider. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Actually, there's a type. This is just to catch if someone was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That now it makes sense. Yeah, sorry. That was a, a huge type. So yeah, so it indeed. Now you can see it's completely linear, right? So before it was quite a bit. Yeah. So uh now it's completely linear. And we can do the algebra again, but we will find that uh mm -hmm. these quadratic terms uh get mixed up. Uh, so, so now we have L0 and H as linear operators, and, uh, and, and when we have linear operators, it's very easy to find what the symmetry is, because uh, as linear operators, these are just matrices, right? So we have these 4 by 4 matrices, and the space of all possible 4 by 4 matrices is spanned by gamma matrices, so indeed, gamma matrices form a complete basis of four by four matrices. And indeed, the whole structure of this uh, four by four matrices uh, assembles into an O4, my two algebra, or uh, uh, this is also isomorphic to some version of SL4, I think. But we call, we, we, the full structure is essentially just O4, comma two. And what we have to do is we have to find linear transformations uh, that commute with both of these operators, right? So this would be the hidden symmetries. This would be uh, the operations in twister space that preserve the Hamiltonian and preserve uh, the energy. And, uh, and it's very easy, right? Because right now in this parameterization, anything that I write down in twister space preserves the energy. Yeah, I, I guess the, the the place where I was getting confused. Like normally, you have the Hamiltonian as like a vector, but here it was a it was a like a, a quadratic operator. Yeah. Um, so, it, is it does there normally exist a quadratic operator in your theory that that 
I guess they always is like a, the Hamilton is always. Cool. I guess I, I'm sorry to cut. Normally, this Hamilton is not the same as a time translator symmetry. Maybe that's where I'm getting confused. Is that what the difference is? Because normally you take the time translation symmetry as a Hamiltonian, and that time translation symmetry is generated by some vector. But here you have a quadratic operator that is your Hamiltonian by construction. And it's not, it, it's, that is not necessarily related to an equivalent time translation symmetry. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Uh, this, this slide is uh, the answer. So the time translation symmetry, so I, I, I'm using some abuse of terminology. The time translation symmetry is L0. It's just an isometry of the space time. So indeed, this is a killing vector, right? The Hamiltonian, or what I call the Hamiltonian, is to make the connection with the hydrogen atom story. Is in this case is the D'Alembert. So I guess in in the situation you're referring is the mass or the mass square. Okay, so maybe yeah, they shouldn't call it Hamiltonian, uh, but indeed it matches the Hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom. Um, but yeah, that answer your question. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah, so uh, let me, yeah. I'm sure you did this algebra better than I did. But you can just check uh, by introducing DD set that um, uh, actually, let me just very, very quickly write down DD set. So this is, so DD set is D set one, D set two, set one bar, set one, set two bar. If you compute this combination, you will just essentially merge uh, the off diagonal terms, right? So you will merge set DD set with DD set bar, and you will merge set with set bar, and that will will land you uh, this combination will land you in this Hamilton. Okay, I, I hope I hope I convey that. And then um, okay, so so now we're in this linear space, right? So now. Uh, L0 is uh, is the identity. Why do I say the identity? Well, I, I, I can write it in this way. Right, that's L0. It's identity. And then H is uh, gamma zero because I can write it as a gamma zero, as a differential operator, right? Okay, so now it's just algebra, right? So now I have these two operations. What operations commute with them? Well, I just need to remember how to do algebra with uh, with these Pauli matrices, and I'm I'm going to spare you the, the the computation, but it's actually very simple uh, to show that ki written in this in this way, so gamma i gamma star, uh, gamma star I remind you is just gamma one gamma two gamma three gamma zero. Uh, uh, it commutes with uh, gamma zero. And um, everything commutes with L0, right? In this parametrization, everything commutes with L0. And then uh, you can also, if, if something commutes with gamma zero, you can multiply it by gamma zero and it still commutes with gamma zero, right? Uh, so you can just multiply by gamma zero and both K and L, are now commuting with uh, with uh, with L zero and 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 H. So let me just let me just write it down. It's a it's a very short computation to check that L zero sorry K I uh, commutes with L zero obviously because it's identity uh, which commutes with uh, H and commutes with Li commutes with L0 and uh, K Li commutes with H. Um, you can you can ask what what. Uh, what happens with the uh, with the relation between Li and Ki, right? Because from this perspective, it looks like Li is gamma zero times Ki, right? Um, 
but that is not a com is not a commutator, right? So so what we can do in this in this uh, parameterization is only compute commutators, but not products. So so this is a fact that if you take two um, vector fields, the product of those vector fields is not a, a vector field, right? Only the commutator is. So indeed, even if if, if this formula uh, holds in this uh, in this algebra, it doesn't hold as a vector field. So what's going on? If I understand correctly, what's going on is that there's always like a dyad, like be like you're treating these like operators, and there's always like a dyad in the background that's being act that these operators are acting on. Is that what's yeah. going on? Which is why you, you're looking at commutations on specifically products. Um, so so in 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 the sense that like for example these gamma matrices, you would represent them like polyspin matrices, yeah. and then there'd be a dyad acting on them. Is, is that what's happening in the background of all of this? Um, I, I say I, I would say it's more simple than that. Okay. I I would say I would say it's it's more simple than that. Uh, let let me let me just explain it. Uh, in this in this part, because this is this is this is kind of the the, the key observation, right? So we have two vector fields, uh, and we write the vector fields uh, in sort of a you know differential form. We write it as d d set mu. B is a mu, right? And then we multiply them together, right? The result has a term that is quadratic, right? So the result has a term that goes like E, sorry, A mu B nu, D set mu, D set mu, right? But it also has a linear term, which is uh, uh, D nu B mu, uh uh a mu d d mu sorry d mu right so when we compute commutators when we compute commutators this quadratic term uh cancels right because we are sort of anti-symmetrizing right yeah. and so we only get a, a d field we only get a vector field right so indeed the the, the commutator of of uh, of a vector field gives me another vector field, so I can I can do a commutator in the matrix language or in the vector language, and I get the same, but I don't get the same product, right? So that's why I can only trust in this in this in this algebra I can only trust uh, uh, commutators, not products, which is good because because uh, as I already hinted with the, with the notation. This ki is uh, is the uh, Laplace Rungenes vector, and this li is the angular momentum generator. So, so there's something similar here with what you're describing with the commutator set of product is something similar to like when you try to construct the Laplace Rungenes vector for the hydrogen atom because it's not quite the same as the classical one because the angular momentum and the position operators will commute. Yeah, very good. So. Yeah, I think that I think that um, ambiguity only happens when you have sort of quadratic operators, right? Yeah. Quadratic operators. But in this case, so that ambiguity is mapped to uh, how you. You see, everything here is linear. Uh, so, so, so this, this, these operators are linear operators. So, the, really, there is no ambiguity in how you multiply them. Uh, Okay. But but that's part of the magic of the twister space. If we were not in twister space, uh, we have to deal with this uh, quantization problem. Does that make sense? But also, I think that probably we can also describe the original and hydrogen atom in terms of twist terms. We didn't do it, but so there's no difference in this sense. There's no what? Yeah. There's no difference between this problem and that hydrogen atom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's say, language. I guess uh, yeah. the, 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 I was I was thinking that the the it, this it seems very similar in flavor to the fact that the Laplace formula is very just like L cross R. Yeah. Maybe just naively write down L cross R as a quantum operator. It doesn't it doesn't work. So you have to subtract off a linear term in a similar way that you meant in a mentioning. So you have to like add a quantum correction to it. Or some sort of correction due to the 
the yeah kind of the way how quantum mechanics works, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and then you 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 are faced with the problem of how to find the right the right correction, like how to yeah. find the right order of operators. And and what I'm saying is that once you write things in linear form, then the right prescription to quantum mechanics comes from Fourier transforming. Uh, comes from Fourier transforming these operators. Uh, because these operators are always linear, so there's no ambiguity. Uh, so, for instance, uh, let, me, let me just uh, I'm of this one coming. We run out of time. Okay, so I'm out of time. So, uh, so all all the beautiful twist of theory goes to the, uh, to the next year. Yeah, but uh, but uh, yeah. So I, I guess I, I just convey to you that things simplify a lot in this space. Um, so uh, let's just let's just very quickly sort of wrap up uh, by uh, motivating uh, sort of a more astrophysical situation, right? So so we saw that you know the wave equation uh, has a very nice representation in in twister space, uh, has a lot of symmetry. All that symmetry is just coming from this power, this Dirac gamma matrices. All this O4, comma two is just you know all possible combinations of gamma matrices, uh, so it's completely it's completely trivial. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, you have you know when when people talk about conformal symmetry, that's O4, comma two, but that's also SL4. So that means that there is something that has four indices, and that 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 something was was presented. Uh, but then of course we left uh, we uh, sort of left uh, on. Uh, a, we 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 sort of derail from uh from our final objective which was care so we at least should comment on how to get back to 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 the astrophysical case in which you have not no not charge and uh that's part of a paper we are uh, writing now with Uri uh so I would quickly uh flash out some of the sort of results but uh you shouldn't you shouldn't sort of uh uh, uh look look uh, Look at it in 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 in, in much detail, but essentially, essentially, what 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 happens is that um, we take uh, we take the, uh, let me just skip this part. We take the care shield ansatz for care, right? So so care has a very simple looking uh, uh, gauge uh, uh, choice in which uh, you can sort of linearize the metric. But it's completely nonlinear solution, uh, and there is two sort of null congruence called L and eta, uh, and in, in this sort of language, essentially the the metric is linearized around any sort of background. In this case, we can pick the sample point, right? So we can pick the point where m is n, and we can sort of expand around the sample point by this parameter lambda, right? So this is some kind of fine structure. Uh, coupling away from the subplot. So we are going to break some symmetries of the conformal uh, group. And because the metric and the D'Alembertian are dual, the same uh, splitting happens for the D'Alembertian. And indeed, we find that uh, we can linear linearize around the subplot point uh, by this parameter lambda. And instead of having these not congruences, we just have these two uh, potential functions. OK? Um, so let's focus on the A0 case. So let's just do Schwarzschild for now. Uh, you can sort of do some rescale of, uh, of uh, Schwarzschild uh, uh, wave function. Uh, it's given by this, uh, by this function. And what happens is that essentially your Hamiltonian becomes quadratic in lambda. So that's kind of a magical thing that's coming from this Kirchhoff gauge, right? So, uh, the Hamiltonian just becomes a quadratic function uh, in, in uh, around the subplot point, but it's completely uh, uh, it's, it's a full Hamiltonian, right? So I'm, I'm not perturbing, I'm not linearizing anything. And and then what I can do is I can solve the subplot problem. I can solve H zero first, and then I can just perturb around the subplot point. Uh, so that's done in the paper. And what we find at the end of the day is that the sort of Spectrum you you get at the sample point gets uh, corrected and the the generacy of the spectrum because you have too many symmetries gets lifted in the sense that now the energy levels are a function of the angular momentum value right so now the symmetry has been broken 
by this sort of uh, hyperfine splitting uh, coming away from the cellular point. And then you can start perturbing around uh, around uh, the cellular point and find corrections to the spectrum uh, for either uh, Schwarzschild or care uh, in, in general. So, so that's part of the upcoming work that connects the cell plot point to the previous results of uh, care spectrum. So, so you mean those are the positive number of frequencies for? Yeah, good. We need to talk about this because uh, the Quasinama frequencies have a particular boundary condition. So indeed, mm. we have been uh, confused about this uh, for, for a bit. Uh, but indeed, we expect to find uh, something that looks like that. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'll let you guys read the discussion. Uh, and I think I, I can just wrap up here. Uh, I think we should. Yeah. 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 We can probably thank Alfredo again for the very nice talk. Yeah. 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 Y